when the shit hit the ceiling. Once it happened, one day in court, the Emperor Akbar asked, What do you think gives the most pleasure to a person? There was a chorus of responses. One courtier said, Serving God is the greatest pleasure, Your Highness. There are always all manner of psychopaths around emperors. So someone else said, Oh my Lord, serving you is the greatest pleasure I can conceive of. A third courtier said, Just gazing at your face is the ultimate joy. The hyperbole poured forth. Birbal, the wise, just sat there, bored. Akbar asked, Birbal, what makes you so silent? What is it that gives you the greatest pleasure? Birbal said, shitting. Until then, Akbar was feeling great with all the fawning and adoration. Now he got mad. He said, for uttering such an obscenity in court, you had better prove it. If you can't prove it, your life is at risk. Birbal said, give me a fortnight, your highness, I'll prove it to you. Akbar said, fine. The next weekend, Birbal organized a hunting trip for Akbar into the forest and made sure all the women in the palace also traveled on this expedition. He set up the camp in such a way that Akbar's tent was in the center. All around, he placed the families, women, and children. He told the catering department to produce the best food. They produced the choicest, choicest delicacies and Akbar ate well. He was on a vacation after all. The next morning, he, when he got up and came out, he saw that there was no toilet tent. He went back into his tent and walked up and down, but the pressure was building up. He tried to go into the forest, but Birbal had made sure the woman folk were all over the place. Pressure built up by the minute. It was about 12 noon and Akbar couldn't bear it anymore. He was just about to burst. Birbal, who was watching this whole scene, kept walking around muttering. Toilet tent, where to put it, where to put it? He was simply creating confusion and delaying matters a little longer. The emperor was full of shit, and just when there was no more time left, they managed to set up the toilet tent. Akbar went inside and moaned with relief. Then Birbal, who was waiting for him outside the tent, asked, Do you agree with me now? Akbar said, It is the greatest pleasure. Relief from something that you cannot hold within you is always the greatest pleasure, isn't it? Whatever the thing may be. So, the body can become an issue, a big issue, a barrier between you and your enjoyment of life. If you want to maintain the body in a certain way, it is important to pay attention to the various activities of the body in relation to food, sleep, and sex. We will look at each of these in turn in the next few pages. Sadhana. It is important not to keep eating through the day. If you are below 30 years of age, three meals every day will fit well into your life. If you are over 30 years of age, it is best to reduce it to two meals per day. Our body and brain work at their best only when the stomach is empty. So be conscious of eating in such a way that within two and a half hours, your food moves out of the stomach and within 12 to 18 hours completely out of the system. With a simple awareness, you will experience much more energy, agility, and alertness. These are the ingredients of a successful life, irrespective of what you choose to do with it. Food as fuel. Your physical body is just an accumulation of food. Yoga pays much attention to food because what kind of food you put into the system has a tremendous impact on the kind of body you have constructed. There is a whole yogic science behind what to eat, how to eat, and when to eat. What kind of stuff you put into it determines the quality of the body and how comfortable it is with itself. Are you preparing this body to run as swiftly as a cheetah? Or are you preparing this body to carry 200 pounds? 
Or are you preparing this body so that it becomes conducive for higher meditative possibilities? You need to eat the right kind of food depending on your inclination and what you want out of your life. The way you eat not only decides your physical health, but the very way you think, feel, and experience life. Trying to eat intelligently means understanding what kind of fuel this body is designed for and accordingly supplying it so that it functions at its best. Let us say you bought a gasoline car. You pumped diesel into it. It might still move around, but it would not function at its optimal capacity and its lifespan would also be substantially reduced. Similarly, if we do not understand what kind of fuel this body is designed for, if we just force whatever comes onto our plate and into our systems, it will definitely not function at its optimum capacity and its longevity could be seriously compromised. The compatibility of the fuel and the machine is of great importance if you are seeking a certain caliber of service. What kind of food is the human system really designed for? If you eat certain foods, the body becomes happy. If you eat certain other foods, the body turns dull and lethargic and your sleep quota increases. If you sleep for 8 hours a day and you live 100 years, you have spent one third of your life sleeping. Another 30 to 40% is spent on food, toilet, and other ablutions. There is very little time left for life. You eat food for energy, but if you eat a big meal, do you feel energetic or lethargic? Depending upon the quality of the food that you eat, you first feel lethargy, and then slowly you start feeling energetic. Why is this so? One aspect is the fact that your system cannot digest cooked food as it is. It needs certain enzymes to do so. All the enzymes necessary for the digestive process are not present in the body alone. The food that you eat also contains these enzymes. When you cook the food, generally 80 to 90% of the enzymes are destroyed. So the body is struggling to reconstitute these destroyed enzymes. The enzymes that you destroy in cooking can never be totally reconstituted. So generally, for most human beings, about 50% of the food that they eat becomes waste. Another aspect is the stress on the system. The body has to process all this food just to get a small quota of energy for its daily activity. If we ate foods with the necessary enzymes, the system would be functioning at a completely different level of efficiency and the conversion ratio of food to energy would be very different. Eating natural foods in their uncooked conditions when the cells are still alive will bring an enormous sense of health and vitality to the system. One can easily experiment with this. Don't ask your doctor, your nutritionist, or your yoga teacher. When it comes to food, it is about the body. Ask the body what kind of food it is most comfortable with, not your tongue. The kind of food your body feels most comfortable with is always the ideal food to eat. You must learn to listen to your body. As your body awareness evolves, you will know exactly what a certain food will do to you. You do not even have to put it into your mouth. You can develop this kind of heightened sensitivity whereby just looking at or touching the food will be enough for you to know its potential impact on your system. Sadhana You can experiment. Arrange the best possible meal for you. Get angry with something, curse the whole world, and then eat it. You will see that day how food behaves within you. At the next meal, approach your food with the reverence that the life-making material deserves and eat it. You will now see how it will behave within you. Of course, if you're sensible, you'll ignore the first and only do the second. Most people can bring down the quantum of e food they are eating to a third and be much more energetic and not lose weight. It is just a question of how much receptivity you have created within yourself. Accordingly, your body receives. If you can do the same amount of work, maintain all the bodily processes with 30% of the food that you eat, that definitely means you are running a much more efficient machine. In a nutshell, 
The pranic value of all seeds is tremendous because they represent concentrated life. This is quite apart from their enormous nutritional value. What you call a nut is essentially just a seed, and a seed is a wonderful possibility. A seed is the future of a plant's life. A single seed is capable of making the entire earth green. Consequently, consuming anything in seed form can greatly enhance human health on many levels. As far as possible, soak the nuts that you intend to consume in water for 6 to 8 hours, especially if they are dry nuts. All seeds have a certain natural chemical self-protection. Soaking in water will flush out these sub toxic substances and bring them to the surface. And this can be eliminated by peeling off the skin of the nut. Additionally, soaking them helps lower the concentrated protein content which sometimes make them difficult to digest. Hell's Kitchen there is an ongoing debate between the proponents of vegetarianism and non-vegetarianism. I am often asked which is better. Vegetarians are often inclined to act holier than though, while non-vegetarians often claim they are more robust, robust and fit for the world. Given that they are willing to include all the species on the planet on their menu, great philosophies have evolved based on food choices. In yoga, there is absolutely nothing religious, philosophical, spiritual, or moral about the food that we eat. It is only a question of whether the food is compatible with the kind of body that we own. This compatibility depends on various ends. If being big is your highest, as highest aspiration, then certain types of foods have to be consumed. If you want a body that supports a particular level of intelligence, or if you want a body with a certain level of alertness, awareness, and agility, other types of food must be consumed. If you are not someone who will settle just for health and the pleasures of life, but want a body pers perceptive enough to download the cosmos, you will need to eat in a very different way. Depending on your aspiration, you will accordingly have to manage your diet. Or if your aspirations involve all these dimensions, you will have to find a suitable balance. Keeping aside our personal goals and aspirations, what type of fuel is this body designed for? This is something to which all of us should first pay attention. Modifications, adjustments, and adaptations of diet should come later. If it is simply a question of basic survival, eat whatever you want. But once survival is taken care of, and there is a choice, it is important that you eat consciously and are led not by the compulsion of the tongue, but by the essential design of your body. In the animal kingdom, you can largely classify animals as herbivores and carnivores, those that eat vegetable matter and those that consume meat or prey upon other animals. Between these two categories of creatures, there are fundamental differences in the design and construction of their physical systems. Since our focus is food, let us explore the digestive systems of each. The whole alimentary canal is a digestive tract from the lip to the anal outlet. If you travel down this tube, you will find some very fundamental differences between herbivores and carnivores. Consider a few significant ones. For what? You will find that carnivores are capable of only a cutting action in their jaws, but the herbivores are capable of both cutting and grinding actions. We human beings have both cutting and grinding actions. What is the reason for this design difference? Suppose you take a bit of uncooked rice and place it in your mouth for a minute or more. You will notice that it turns sweet. This sweetness is happening because right there in your mouth, Carbohydrates are getting converted into sugar, an essential part of the digestive process, by an enzyme called thialine, which is in your saliva. Thialine is present in the saliva of all herbivores but not in carnivores. So carnivores just have to cut their food into smaller pieces and swallow it, while herbivores have to chew their food. Mastication involves grinding and then thoroughly mixing the food with the saliva, hence the design modification in the jaw. If mastication happens properly, 
close to 50% of your digestive process would be finished in the mouth. In other words, the stomach region is expecting partially digested food to efficiently complete the process. In modern life, people are in such a hurry that we gulp or rush our lunches without the food being properly masticated. The stomach is burdened not only with undigested food, but also with partially destroyed food. Today's kitchens have largely become places where food is efficiently destroyed. Food that is nutritious and full of life is systematic, systematically degraded through the cooking process, which depletes its nutritional value and largely obliterates its pranic value, its capacity to be spiritually supported. Next, if you look at the length of the alimentary canal for herbivores, it is generally about five to six times the length of their bodies. In carnivores, it ranges from two to three times the length of their bodies. To put it simply, carnivores have distinct, distinctly shorter alimentary canals than herbivores. And this difference clearly indicates what type of food each species is supposed to consume. If you eat raw meat, it takes between 70 to 72 hours to pass through your system. Cooked meat takes 50 to 52 hours. Cooked vegetables, 24 to 30 hours. And cooked vegetables, 12 to 15 hours. Fruits, one and a half to three hours. If you keep raw meat outside for 70 to 72 hours, putrific putrefaction sets in. One small piece of meat can evict you from your home. Putrefaction occurs very rapidly in the summertime when the temperature and moisture are conducive. Your stomach is always a tropical place and if meat stays there for up to 72 hours, the level of putrefaction is very high. This essentially means there is excessive bacterial activity and your body must expend a lot of energy to contain the bacterial level so that it does not cross the line that separates health from illness. If you visit a friend who is sick in the hospital, you would surely not take him a pizza or a steak. You are most likely to take him fruit. If you happen to be in the wild, what would be the first thing you would eat? Definitely fruit. You remember even Adam ate an apple, although we know what trouble that got him into. Then would come roots, the killing of an animal, cooking and raising crops. Fruit is the most easily digestible food and all human beings know this instinctively. Most carnivorous animals do not eat every day, definitely not three times a day. They know the food they eat moves very slowly through their tracks. A tiger is said to eat once every six to eight days. He is agile and prowls when he is hungry, eats a hefty meal of 55 pounds of meat at once, and then generally sleeps or ambles around lazily. A cobra eats 60% of its own body weight in a single meal, and it's only once every 12 to 15 days. The pygmies from the Central African region used to hunt up elephants eat their organs and meat raw and drink the blood fresh they say they would sleep after this, after this kind of meal for over 40 hours at a stretch but as lifestyles change and grow more urban and sedentary it is clear that human beings cannot maintain such a mode of life you certainly cannot afford this sort of lifestyle you have to eat every day and rest at specific times because your alimentary canal is similar to that of the herbivores. The protein debate. There is much emphasis laid nowadays on eating protein. It is important to understand that only 3% of our body is composed of protein and excess protein consumption can cause cancer. Meat runs high in protein. A small a very small portion of the meat that one, con that one consumes can fulfill the human protein requirement. The remaining portion, which travels very slowly through the alimentary canal, leads to a variety of problems such as excessive bacterial activity, enhanced sleep quota, increased inertia levels in the body, and decreased cellular regeneration. 
all of this in turn manifests as a drop in one's sensitivity of perception. It is in this context that meat has been regarded as spiritually unsupportive because the spiritual process is essentially about enhancing one's perception beyond the limitations of the physical. Digestion drama. Another aspect of digestion is that to digest certain kind of food, the human system produces alkalis, and to digest another kind of food, it generates acid. If you consume a jumble of foods, then the stomach grows confused and produces both acids and alkalis, which neutralize each other and make the digestive juices lose their edge. Hence, the food remains in the stomach longer than required and weakens our ability to rejuvenate on the cellular level. It also causes what we refer to as tamas or inertia in the energy system, which over a period of time will alter the very quality of who you are and impair the quality of who you could be. Traditionally in southern India, people took care never to mix certain foods, but today, Food is no more about the well-being of the body, but a social affair. People eat out at buffets, and the variety and number of dishes served is considered more important than nourishing the health and life of the body. The question is not about what not to eat, but about how much of what to eat. It is not a moral issue. It is a question of life sense. As you battle city life, you need an agile and working mind and physical and mental balance. And some of you even have spiritual aspirations, even if it is only every once in a while. So every individual must arrive at his or her own balance of diet, not by taking vows, but by observation and awareness. It is important not to turn into a food freak. Food should never become an all-consuming affair. Every creature on the planet knows what to eat and what not to. What is the human problem then? The human problem is not enough attention, but too much information. The yogic science works essentially with the interiority of the human being. Out of its profound understanding of the science of the human mechanism, this science later branched out in various systems. One such outcome was the system of Ayurveda, which is growing increasingly popular once again in modern times. The word Ayur means lifespan, and the word Veda means science or knowledge. So Ayurveda is the science of extending the human lifespan. It is a system that uses external plant life and earth elements to promote health and to correct systemic irregularities. Knowledge systems like this were intended to assist those who are incapable of doing the necessary yogic practice to achieve the same ends. Sadhana. The consumption of a spoonful of clarified butter, ghee or ghee in India, on a daily basis, a few minutes before a meal does wonders for the digestive system. If you eat clarified butter with sugar, as in sweets, it is digested and turns into fat. But clarified butter without sugar can cleanse, heal, and lubricate the alimentary canal. Additionally, the cleansing of the colon will immediately manifest as a certain glow and aliveness in your skin. Even those who prefer not to consume dairy products could experiment with this because clarified butter passes through the system largely without getting digested. Evolutionary Code If you must eat non-vegetarian food, the best would be fish. Firstly, it is easily digestible with very high nutritional values. Secondly, it leaves the least amount of its imprint upon you. What is meant by this? Our bodies, all that we eat, excrete, and what eventually gets cremated or buried is just earth. The software within your system determines that if you eat a fruit, it is transformed into the human body and not into a monkey or a mouse. The efficiency of your system obliterates the other software that transforms soil into a fruit and arrives at a new software that will make a fruit into a human form. For more evolved creatures, particularly mammals, their software is more distinct and individuated. 
This makes it harder for your code-breaking system to erase the software of the creature that you consume and to overwrite it with a new software. Among the animals, fish, being one of the earlier forms of life upon this planet, have the easiest software code for our system to break and integrate into ourselves. Animals that have more intelligence, particularly those that are capable of a variety of emotions, such as cows or dogs, will retain their own memory systems. In other words, we are incapable of completely integrating more evolved, intelligent, and emotionally endowed creatures into our systems. In earlier times, in communities that were more in tune with the earth, people could hunt and eat animals and work out the consequences through enormous amounts of physical activity. But given the largely sedentary lives people lead nowadays, the acidity produced by such a diet could generate greatly to the unexplained levels of stress that are being widely experienced today. Additionally, large animals, particularly cows, are aware of their impending slaughter well before it happens. Consequently, they experience high stress levels which generate a tremendous amount of acidic content in their systems. This in turn has its own adverse impact on those who later consume the meat. Gastronomic sense. If you observe the natural cycle of the body, you will find that there is something called a mandala. A mandala is a cycle of 40 to 48 days that the human system goes through. In every cycle, there will be three days on which your body does not need food. If you are conscious of how your body functions, you will become aware that on a particular day, the body does not require food. Without effort, you can go without food on that day. Even dogs and cats have this awareness. On a particular day, they often choose not to eat. The day the system says no food is a cleanup day. Since most people are not aware of which day their body should go without food, the day of Ekadashi was fixed in the Indian calendar. Ekadashi is the 11th day of the lunar segment and recurs every 14 days. It is traditionally regarded as the day to fast. If some people are unable to go without food because their activity levels demand it, or if they do not have the appropriate spiritual practice to support it, they can opt to go on a fruit diet. If you force yourself to fast without preparing your food, your body and mind sufficiently, you will only cause damage to your health. But if your body, mind, and energy are properly prepared with the necessary practices, then fasting can be of much benefit to you. People who are constantly on nicotine and caffeine will find that fasting can become very difficult. So before fasting, prepare the body by consuming the right kind of nourishment, particularly high water content foods like fruits and vegetables. It may not be a good thing for everybody to fast, but it has many benefits if it is done with proper understanding. The entire aim and endeavor of yoga is to open up the cocoon of the physical body to the larger sensory body where you experience everything as a part of you. Fasting is an extension of this logic it is a way of nourishing yourself without any active ingestion. It may be done as a detoxification process nowadays, but this is the inter internal rationale. This is why every spiritual tradition in the world has fixed a certain period of fasting for its adherents. In the yogic tradition, the fasting period was fixed according to the lunar cycle. This is because your ability to assimilate energy from water air, and sunlight is greater on certain days of the lunar cycle. In some religions, the fasting period was fixed in a peak summer when the consumption of water and sun by the human system would naturally be high. My great-grandmother, a wonderful old woman often considered eccentric by those who didn't know any better, would frequently give away her food to ants and sparrows. Tears of bliss would be streaming down her face as she did this. People around her kept saying, Why don't you eat, old woman? She'd simply reply, I am full. But all those advisors died a long time before she did. She lived on and died at the incredible age of 113. My mother used to do this as well. 
every day before she ate her breakfast, she would take one handful of it and go looking for ants to feed. Only then she would eat. This has been a tradition among the woman folk in many families. An ant is the smallest living entity you can see around you, the most inconse inconsequential organism you can think of. So, for that very reason, you feed it first. You make an offering not to the gods or other celestial creatures, but to the smallest creature you know. This planet belongs as much to them as it belongs to you. You understand that every creature on this planet has the same right to live as you have. This awareness can help create a conducive atmosphere, mentally and physically, for consciousness to grow. Just a simple act like this loosens you from your identification with the physical body. As you become less of a body, your awareness of the other dimensions of who you are naturally becomes enhanced. When you are very hungry, all your body wants to do is eat. Just wait for two minutes, you will find that it will make a big difference. When you are very hungry, you are the body. Give it a little space and suddenly you are not just a body. Gautama the Buddha went to the extent of saying, when you are badly in need of food, if you give away your food for, to somebody else, you will become stronger. I'm not going that far with you. I am only saying, just wait a few minutes. It will defi definitely leave you stronger. If you are very compulsive about food, it is good to miss one meal consciously. Try doing this. On a day when you are particularly hungry and some of your favorite dishes are being cooked, try skipping a meal. This is not to torture yourself. This is just to become free from the torture chamber that your body can very easily become. What kind of food you eat, how much you eat, how you eat, turning it from a compulsive pattern into a conscious process, this is the essence of fasting. Sadhana. Just experiment. Start with 25% natural, uncooked, or live food, fruits or vegetables, today, and slowly push it up to 100% in about 4 or 5 days. Stay there for a day or two, and again, cut it down by 10%, and in another 5 days, you will reach 50% raw food, 50% cooked food. This is ideal for most people who wish to be active for 16 to 18 hours a day. Remember, if you eat cooked food, it may take you 15 minutes to eat a meal. If you eat raw food, you take a little more time to eat the same quantum of food because you have to chew a little more. But the nature of the body is such that after 15 minutes, the body will tell you that your meal is over. So people tend to eat much less and lose weight. All it takes is being a little more conscious of how much you are eating. Restful, restlessness to restfulness. The fact that you sleep at night makes some difference between your mornings and evenings. What is making the difference is the level of relaxation that sleep brings. If you could remain relaxed while performing all the activity of the days, you would be about the same in the evening in terms of energy and enthusiasm as you were in the morning. If you wake up fresh, that is a good beginning, but slowly through the day as your relaxation levels come down, you gradually start feeling stressed. Stress is not because of work. This is important to remember. Everybody thinks their job is stressful. No job is stressful. There are many jobs that could present challenging situations. There could be nasty bosses, insecure colleagues, emergency rooms, impossible deadlines, or you might even find yourself in the middle of a war zone. But these are not inherently stressful. It is our compulsive reaction to these situations in which we are placed that cause stress. Stress is a certain level of internal friction. One can easily lubricate the inner mechanism with some amount of inner work and awareness. So it is your inability to handle your own system that is stressing you out. On some level, you do not know how to handle your body, mind, and emotions. That is the problem. How then do you keep your system free of stress so that you remain in the same level of enthusiasm, relaxation, and happiness 
whether it is morning or evening? An average person's pulse rate on an empty stomach would be in the 70s or even 80s. For a person doing the right type of meditative practice, practice, you will find that the pulse rate would range between the 30s and 40s. Even after a good lunch, it would stay in the 50s. This is just one parameter that indicates the level of restfulness that your body is experiencing moment to moment. Restfulness essentially defines the replenishing and rejuvenating cap capability of the body. You cannot slow down your system at the cost of activity. What is necessary is to keep your system in such a way that activity does not take its toll upon it. Maybe physically you get exhausted, but it need not stress you in any way. If you are capable of being vibrantly active and still relaxed, then it is worthwhile. If you start certain simple practices of yoga, in 3 to 4 months time, your pulse rate will drop at least 8 to 20 counts very easily. That means the body is running so much more efficiently and at a relaxed pace. What the body needs is not sleep but restfulness. If you keep the body very relaxed through the day, your sleep quota will go down naturally. If your work and taking a walk or exercising are also relaxation for you, your sleep quota will drop even further. Right now, people want to do everything the hard way. I see people walking in the park in a state of tension. Whether you walk or jog, why can't it be done easily, joyfully? This exercise may be causing more harm to you than well-being because you are going at it as if you're going into battle. Don't battle with life. You are not anti-life. You are life. Just get in tune with it and you will see that you will pass through it easily. Keeping yourself fit and well is not a battle. Do some activity that you enjoy. Play a game, swim, walk, run. If you don't like to do anything except eat cheesecake all day, then you have a problem. Otherwise, there is no incompatibility between being active and relaxed at the same time. How much sleep does your body need? It depends on the level of physical activity you are engaged in. There is no need to fix the quota of either food or sleep. To program the calories you must consume and the number of hours you must sleep is a foolish way to handle life. Let the body decide how much it should eat today, not you. Today, your activity levels are low, so you eat less. Tomorrow, your activity is high, so you eat more. Similarly with sleep, when you feel sufficiently relaxed, you come awake. The moment the body is rested, it will wake up, whether it be at 3 or 4 or 8 o'clock. When it comes to food and sleep, your body is the best judge. If the body is at a certain level of alertness and awareness, you will see that once it is well rested, it will awaken. That is, if it is eager to come to life. If it is somehow trying to use the bed as a grave, then it is a problem. Keep the body in such a way that it is not longing to avoid or escape life. Maintain it in such a way that it is longing to come awake. Sadhana If you sleep without a pillow or a, with a very low pillow, which doesn't allow the spine to get pinched, the neuronal regeneration of the brain and the cellular regeneration of the neurological system will be much better. If you sleep without a pillow, it is best to lie on your back in a supine position rather than on your side. Lying in this position is referred to in yoga as Shavasana. It enhances the purification and rejuvenation of the body, promotes the free flow of movement in the energy system, bringing relaxation and vitality. But there is no reason to get dogmatic about this. At least in your sleep, don't take a position. <laughs>